too many Americans suffer or die from illnesses and diseases that are preventable or treatable. Um, and it isn't a matter just of some Americans being luckier than others. Decades of research have proven that minorities and low-income Americans are much less likely to get the care and the treatment that they need. And that's why we're all here today. Um, we know that this is a health issue and that it's also a civil rights issue. Who you are, the color of your skin, the amount of money in your pocket shouldn't determine whether you have access to essential health care. Not in America, not in the 21st century. Health reform offers us the opportunity to help reduce these disparities. And so we're so pleased that you joined us today for this important discussion. President Obama has committed to passing health care reform this year, and we want to ensure that our new reform and health care system has eliminates the health disparities that have plagued our nation for too long. We're actively engaged in discussions like this one at regional forums around the country, uh, both live and through our website, www.healthreform.gov, which I encourage you to go to, and which this meeting is being uh, webcast on today. We want to hear from you today, and we want to keep hearing from you as we work together to get health care reform passed this year. Before I, before we open up,
White House Office of Health Reform, and with Tina Chen, um, who represents uh, the Office of Public Engagement and has been involved in a lot of these conversations. Um, you all are the uh, stakeholders who represent the uh, underserved populations across America. And one of the challenges, I think, is to shine a spotlight on what's really happening talk about folks with that insurance, that's a piece of the problem, but the other piece is the care delivered to those who are insured, those who are underinsured, and those who are uninsured, which is also um, very uh, disparate, depending on who you are and what hospital you go to and what provider you see. So um, I really appreciate you being here today. Um, we have uh, just published a report tables and a copy is available. I want you to know that not only is it available online on at the healthreform.gov website in English starting today, but by the end of the week it will also be in Spanish uh, on the website. And we hope to push this out to audiences across the country. And unfortunately it confirms what you all know too well, which is an alarming disparity in the delivery of quality health
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Winston Wong. I'm a physician representing the National Council of Asian Pacific American Physicians. I'm also sitting on the IOM's Roundtable on Health Disparities, and I also am the Medical Director for Community Benefit at Kaiser Permanente. I think one of the issues that we'd like to raise is the question of looking at uh, disparities, not only as a question of differences in measurement, but as a question of equity with regard to access and the social determinants of what rise in terms of health disparities. In the former health center, uh, I'm Dan Hawkins, representing the nation's health centers. 
uh, <clears throat> that today provide care to upwards of 20 million Americans, 90% of whom are low income, uh, two thirds of whom are people of color, and here to uh, reinforce and underscore health centers' <clears throat> continuing commitment to 100% access and zero health disparities. And you're so right, coverage does not equal access. My name is Faye Williams, former trial lawyer Latina, and uh, I serve as national chair of the National Congress of Black Women. We deal with all challenges for black families, including health and especially childhood obesity. I'm Andrea Lavario, senior public policy advocate for the Human Rights Campaign, the nation's largest uh, advocacy organization for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights. On behalf of our 800,000 uh, supporters and allies nationwide, we're looking forward to working with you and getting help with one thousand trips. Hello, another Andrea. Uh, Andrea Taylor. I am a member of the Executive Board of the American Public Health Association, representing over 23,000 members of public health practitioners around the country, from public health nurses to health educators to environmental health practitioners. And thank you for having us in this conversation. Hopefully, as we continue to talk about health reform, we'll also talk about prevention and community-based prevention. And I'm Rebecca Fox, the director of the National Coalition for LGBT Health. I'm using my teacher voice instead of trial lawyer voice. <laughs> and we represent organizations across the country, including community health centers, community centers, state and local departments of health that have a focus or special interest in LGBT health. I just want to feed off something that Barbara, my colleague, said. Um, that we cut across racial and ethnic lines. For example, the um, HIV AIDS, a white gay man will have five HIV tests in his life, and if he comes out positive, will be HIV positive. A black gay man will only have one in his life and will be concurrent with the diagnosis of AIDS. So the overplay between the LGBT community and people of color is incredibly important for us. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Daniel Dawes uh, from the American Psychological Association. I'm a senior legislative and federal affairs officer there, and I handle children, youth, and families issues, HIV and AIDS issues, racial and ethnic minority issues, and American Indian Alaska Native health issues. And um, on behalf of the 150,000 psychologists, uh, members of APA, I just want to thank you all so much for uh, making uh, mental health and mental health care disparities one of the most under-addressed health disparities coming to light in this meeting today, so I thank you so much. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. My name is James Alpino from the Hispanic Federation. I'm the Director of Advocacy here in D.C. We are a member organization serving uh, the Northeast of the United States, over 100 community-based organizations, many of whom are, are health providers. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Hillary Shelton, Director of the NAACP in Washington, New York, and Senior Vice President for Advocacy. We're celebrating our 100th anniversary this year, and we're excited for the prospects. My name is Karina Dan. I'm with the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, working on uh, health policy for Asian uh, Pacific Islanders and other um, <coughs> Native Hawaiians and other uh, Pacific Islanders. And uh, uh, our organization um, represents the health community health organizations that um, primarily serve AAPI um, groups. Um, which also experience tremendous health disparities, and I'm hoping that we will be able to include some of that information in future reports. I'm rather disappointed that that is not in, showcased in this report, um, but there are some major health issues, so I appreciate it. 
Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Celia Maxwell. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Health Sciences at Howard University, and I'm representing Howard University, a uh, significant uh, contributor of health care, uh, particularly uncompensated care uh, through our hospital to the District of Columbia. As one of the leading HBCUs in this nation, we understand the importance of dealing with health disparities because that's what we see. And so we're very, very happy to be a part of this discussion and will help in any way that we can. I'm John Malpin, I'm President of Morehouse School of Medicine, and today I represent the Association of Minority Health Profession Schools. Uh, we are the association that represents historically black health profession schools in, in medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, and veterinary science. And for all of our existence, we've been dedicated to two primary purposes, and that is training the next generation of health professionals, of minority health professionals, and to the elimination of health disparities through development of model delivery programs and prevention programs, as well as our research focus on health disparities. I just make a note today that uh, as I reflect back, 30 years ago I was here in a similar setting with Stuart Eisenstadt and the Carter administration talking about health care uh, inflation. And I've watched over 30 years, and I am so pleased that this is the first time I, I really believe this is a serious conversation about not just reform without change, but true transformation of the health care system. And so I'm pleased to be here with you. <coughs> Disparity. So we would really like to include 
disabilities in this conversation. Health Information Management for a hospital in South Florida. 
and um, he went to the ED. He was uh, noted as black. Then the second time he went, same person, he's white. And it, it sort of raises you know, questions about um, how accurate the data is. So for us, it's whenever possible, making sure that they're um, uh, self-identified, those sort of things. And another reason why this is so critical, um, I think, too, is because you're dealing with, and this is a true story, here in the D.C. area, we have um, a lot of folks who have asthma-related symptoms coming through the emergency department. And uh, many times, these folks are, uh, have lower socioeconomic status. They, um, don't, they don't have the health literacy or the education to understand the difference between an emergency department and an urgent care center. And this administrator friend of mine, what he noticed was, gee, we have a lot of folks coming in. Um, I noticed that they're Latino, but um, it's not helping me uh, to figure out what cultural group they're from. Because if he had that information, let's say they're from the El Salvadorian community, he'd be able to reach out to the community, reach out with their religious leaders, to their health care providers there, and um, develop a culturally and linguistically competent uh, toolkit and um, program seminar that he can share with these folks. Well, he was able to, in the end, he dug and dug and dug because he really cares about this issue. But after digging, he found that, yes, many of them for the El Salvador community. He met with their religious leaders, he met with their community leaders, and um, from there he was able to help them understand the difference between these different healthcare entities. And that's why, you know, data collection for us is so critical, that it goes beyond race and ethnicity and uh, primary language, and that it, it really gets to the culture of things and it's self-identified. So for us, that would be a major issue. Thank you again. Um, for African-American community, coverage is the single most important thing. 25% of us are uninsured. There's also in the Hispanic community, it's even higher than that previous we talked about, about that a little bit. I think coverage, coverage, coverage. If I have to say one thing we must do, that's the coverage. Once the coverage is done, then for our community is the data collection. So we have the right information on the base of it, we can make the right decision, the appropriate decision that we can make. It's a very critical, and my colleagues have really made excellent points in, in making the data collection. The third piece is the manpower gain. I can speak for the African American community. In 1920, per capita, there were more African American doctors than there are today. Okay, wow. that's correct. Oh. And Secretary Sebelius is in your office, and you have the power and the authority to change the manpower dynamics. It's all the incentives that we provide. Right. If you provide the incentive to the minority communities, that are going to be majority communities by 2042, we need to change that direction. And you have your hands on the steering wheel. If you could change in that direction, yeah. we, can, we can make a huge difference, not only in our community, but for this nation because this nation obviously cannot have half the people in poor health and the other half in good health and then claim the leadership in the world. We really need to, we need to do that. And last piece I want to say, I've been to many of these meetings, you know, for a long time. And these meetings are excellent, they're exceptional. It gives us the opportunity to lay out for you what we think is the current issue. But to have sustained input, you need to appoint on critical committees members of the minority who really represent the minority, not who come in from the institution, some backdoor researcher who sits in a dark cubicle and does research and just then comes up and becomes a member of that committee, but people who come from our community so that when the decisions are made on issues such as comparative effectiveness, such as inform health information technology, so that there are people sitting over there who actually understand and might help you folks to do a better job, a less expensive job, and a better quality job that will satisfy everybody else. And I think that will be, be where I, I will stop in saying having those kind of people, if you can't find them, let us know. We'll be glad to help you find those folks. There are plenty of them who have exceptional technical skills, but also represent the community and have connected with the community. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, with a capable leadership of Daniel Daniel brought together a number of organizations to talk about health disparities for over the last couple of months. Um, we looked at a number of about 20 or more policy papers from a variety of organizations that, that came to the table to discuss health disparities. Out of those policy papers, we put together a matrix and drew out some of the 
resilient some of the uh, issues that kept coming to the fore. Out of that, out of that um, analysis, we came up with some specific uh, uh, legislative recommendations that we'd like to share with you that are based on, on actual legislation that has been developed at some point and, and policy papers developed by some of the folks that are actually here on the table. So we'd like to share that with you later on. Well, I'm going to continue with Dr. Actor's uh, train of thought about leadership. When we developed the National Hispanic Medical Association, and it was at the Clinton White House with health care reform then, we saw the need for a voice from doctors from our own communities to be connected. There's a disconnect between the local and the national. And our organization's mission is to improve the health of our communities using doctors who are well-trusted and voices of, of, uh, of health authority within our communities to get the message out. And leadership for us, we develop leadership training programs, is something that public health never focuses on. And all of our health agencies have done a great job with research and, and service delivery. But I think if we focused a little bit more on leadership training within the new prevention models and public health models for our doctors and nurses and all disciplines, that we would see more uh, qualified leaders rise to the top faster. And as we're getting to, to the uh, emerging minority, to becoming the emerging majority, our issue is not only do we not have the pipeline because of the issues of Title VII and Title VIII and every other title, but I think we need a workforce that's about leadership and about interdisciplinary working together and the linkage between HHS, Department of Labor, Department of Education, Department of Defense, the VA, all of those workforce training programs within the, and as a medical student going through residency, we get to see all the different facets of our big institutions, our community clinics, our, our outpatient clinics, our VA hospitals, our community, our county hospitals, but they're never linked and uh, the training funding uh, and diversity guidelines and the, and the prevention and leadership training needs to be a, a front and center for training for the future. Uh, and we do need to increase, uh, we need to change the approach because our, diverse, our diversity, and Mohammed and I have talked about this forever, hasn't changed since the 1970s. I mean, if it wasn't for HCOP and the Centers of Excellence and the HBCU minority leader organist institutions, we wouldn't be where we are. But on the other hand, for the future population, we need to do something drastically different for workforce. Thank you. Those are very, very interesting remarks. I'd like to add to that the University of North Dakota Indian Center Medicine Program which produces most of the American Indian physicians in the country. It's been a very strong public-private partnership that's been quite successful. But I just wanted to mention, really in concert with many of the comments that have already been made today, that in the, in the uh, system that American Indians and Alaska Natives rely upon, the baseline of that system is the trust responsibility between the United States government and the governments of indigenous Indian and Alaska Native tribes. And many of those promises, as I said when I introduced myself, were made right in this room. And the health care that American Indians and Alaska Natives receive in the United States is funded at a level that is 50% of what a federal prisoner receives in health care. People talk about perhaps the Indian health care system is broken. Perhaps it is starving. No one can produce good outcomes on that kind of a basis. Yet the Indian Health Service and the tribally operated programs do an astounding job keeping body and soul together for American Indian and Alaska Native people, but enough is enough. Um, uh, we would totally agree that data collection, meaningful data, is an absolute necessity for any kind of meaningful public policy discussion on how to address health care disparities in the United States, or anywhere for that matter. We often see that American Indians suffer, the number one disease we suffer from is anonymity. But I can see today that we share this with the others in this group, including the disabilities community. Because if you are invisible in America, you do not exist and there is not a problem. And if the data does not exist, then there's not a problem. The data itself is a problem. 
I know from regions in the United States that American Indians and Alaska Natives are acquiring HIV faster than anyone on the planet. No one is talking about that. There's not enough national aggregated data to make the case in a statistically significant way. It's quite significant to us, however. So the other, another element is prevention. All the diseases that we have the greatest suffering from in Indian country and that we share with everyone at this table are preventable. We are 630% more likely to die of alcoholism, 650% more likely to die of tuberculosis, 318% more likely to die of diabetes and its complications, and the number two cause of death for our kids is suicide. This is preventable. All of the constructs that we're looking at in this country, not just for American Indians and for minority groups, or the disabled, they apply to everyone. Um, we also need to look very, very carefully at the workforce issues. We're talking about this in terms of both health care reform for Indian country, but health care reform for the whole country. Of course, when Lyndon Johnson um, transmitted the Medicare proposal to the Congress, that is when the graduate medical education system was born because they foresaw there would be a tremendous need for physicians. We're already there in Indian country. We need to build residency training programs for Native people and Native communities. Some of our greatest problems would be solved if there were easy access, meaningful access, not just coverage, to specialty care and to primary care physicians in our communities. And that is totally achievable. And culturally appropriate care is, is fundamental for American Indians and Alaska Natives. The last thing I'd like to say is, Two quick things. One, we have a paper that we have put together with the National Indian Health Board, the National Congress of American Indians, the National Council on Urban Indian Health, contributed to by the direct service tribes, self-governance tribes, that we have transmitted to you, we've shared with the Hill. We're happy to talk to you more about that and help in any way that we can to make health care reform successful for all Americans. And the Indian Health Care Improvement Act is the baseline law for how American Indians and Alaska Natives receive their health care. It is not health care reform. It is our basis of operating that entire trust responsibility system, and it needs to be reauthorized. And I thank you very much, Miigwech, for listening and for your time. So I wanted to be oddly idealistic for someone who works in Washington, D.C., and to perhaps talk a little about health equity. I think it's very interesting that as healthcare reform moves forward, so is the next iteration of healthy people. And to encourage the emphasis to not just be on disparities, but to what we're aiming for, which is a place of health equity for all Americans and what that can look like. And I would encourage, um, to, when you look at that document, it's 28 objectives, to look at all the places that we're talking about data collection. And under all the LGBT um, objectives, there, it says DNC which is data not collected. And you'll see the same thing for subpopulations among Asian Americans and among Latino Americans. So really to push what that means. And then as healthcare reform moves forward and we're talking about coverage issues, and there's this talk in DC about comparative effectiveness, that a lot of us sitting at this table are left out of those conversations. So even if you look at what's coming out now with the BMI and seeing that the the BMI really only applies to white people, right? And that's what it's based off of, and it means something very different if you're a person of color. So as we move forward with comparative effectiveness, talking about what programs work, to then have the second question be, who's not on this list? Was this inclusive of people with disabilities? Are there people of color here? Are there transgender individuals here? And if not, to always be, when we're tying funds to effectiveness, to be saying who wasn't allowed to even apply to see if it's effective at the same time. And just, you know, from what my colleagues said, we, the coalition, has put together LGBT principles for healthcare reform. It's been signed on to by almost 100 organizations. We've put them around the hill. I would love to be able to send them up to you as well.
that is to make sure that low-income individuals and people of color have meaningful options for coverage. Um, one way to do that, and one of our three-prong framework um, at Families is to make sure that everyone below a certain income um, has um, access to our current safety net for coverage, which is Medicaid. Um, <coughs>
three, uh, three issues, underscoring the issue of prevention. And what I will say is we are the most powerful country in the world, yet we have the best sick care and the worst health care. And that should never be. And that underscores prevention. The other uh, topic that I also wanted to add my support to is the issue of obesity. Obesity is the number one public health problem in this country. As a clinician, uh, most of the comorbidities that I see in patients, be it diabetes, hypertension, uh, or even severe arthritis, is due to obesity. Again, preventable. And some of the points that my colleague made is very important. Now, what I'm really passionate about, I'm an adult infectious diseases doc living in the district, is HIV AIDS how it disproportionately impacts uh, African Americans in the country and particularly in the district. It doesn't make sense that the highest rate per 100,000 population in this entire nation of cases of HIV AIDS are in African American and the District of Columbia. Yet we are in close proximity to four healthcare institutions. Yet if you look at the District of Columbia, areas that really need help are almost like a different state. In order for the patients in Ward 8 or Ward 7 to get help, they have to really cross what's the equivalent of several bridges. And what I would like to suggest, uh, Secretary Sebelius, is that we consider the equivalent of a national PEPFAR. PEPFAR has, uh, is not entirely perfect, but PEPFAR has certainly gone a long way to make a difference in how we focus on AIDS internationally. We need to have that same view and focus on AIDS nationally. This is really one of our most glaring disparities, and it's something that we certainly can do something about. <coughs> to its customers. <laughs> and if we look at it along those lines, I know as I came to the meeting today, got emotionally filled about the meeting for one particular reason, how long, how long, how long. Then the follow-on to that became somebody cares. Healthcare reform is on the way, but we gotta get healthcare reform in all the way. And that takes every one of us on an ongoing basis until it's signed. And within that healthcare reform mix, there's got to be one tier of care. It cannot be a lesser quality of care because, of, because you're poor or because you look different in any way, shape, or form. The care that, we, that will be received, too, also has to include prevention and wellness as a core component of the benefits package. We're concerned that if benefits packages are left totally up to states, there's concern about how that mix can change as it leaves Washington and goes back to the states. And as, and as administrations change, we know that the bill won't be perfect. There is no perfect bill. But we know, too, though, that we can get the best bill that we possibly can get if we all work together. Along those same lines is the workforce piece. Workforce is critical. And you ask yourselves, where are the most job opportunities? They're in the health industry. So it's a natural place to invest and get the great return on that investment counting exponentially a number of times. In the prevention and wellness, it has to be school-based, workplace-based, as well as community-based. And in doing that, it cannot be that it's accessible to one but not to another in terms of, in terms of uh, prevention. The health information technology is critical. We are truly grateful for the major investment that's out there, but we still are concerned that no community we got to make sure that everything is done to make sure that no community is left behind or left out. I know we've heard from some communities, even in terms of stimulus and wanting to respond back, that they don't have the technology to allow them to benefit from the stimulus. And that's something that, that, that's something that is solvable. It has to be solved. 
when we also look at infrastructure, that's critical. And as we look at empowering, communities have to be empowered. Even when we all go to various events and lead those communities, those communities should be left with something that empowers them. The caucuses this morning had a press conference on their bill that they're about to introduce. And I would expect that that will be introduced sometime this week. There will be a number of critical provisions in that bill that are central to effective health care reform because we do know that the elimination of racial and ethnic health disparities is integral to health reform, and health reform is integral to the elimination of health, racial and ethnic health disparities. So we would ask that as that bill comes out, that you would look at that bill, because then there won't be a whole lot of reinventing and a whole lot of extra work, because a number of us in this room put a considerable amount of time in those bills over the years, and they are already in bill language that you can cut and paste and slice from from prevention to health literacy, to nutrition literacy, you name it, to workforce development, to jump-starting the workforce development pipeline, that whole mix of everything. And we do appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for this extraordinary meeting. Um, first, let me say that coverage and the provision of services and access are all very, very important. To, to all of our communities. But how to get there starts with the proper civil rights protections. Um, and that's gonna be um, extremely important in, in the, new, the brave new world of healthcare reform because there are going to be different entities in play. So um, ensuring that there is not discrimination on the basis of race gender, sex, national origin, language. I mean, I can go down the list and, um, and I'm sure I, I can get you our language. Um, in addition, the Office of um, Minority Health has got to be strengthened. And, and there ought to be some sort of, and I think somebody said it, an interagency effort, an interagency task force aimed at eliminating minority disparities uh, because the coordination is very important. Data collection, um, others have spoken um, about it, but we must see the causes, as I said in the introductions, um, genetic, environmental, lack of adequate preventative care. All of these factor in, and we look forward to working with you over this process as we are with the Hill. Thank you. Thank you. As we think of the problem of health disparities, we need to think about the problem of access to care and recognize that cost is only one of the barriers. So even if we reduce cost and, and provide coverage, we need to address some of the system barriers. I also served on the Institute of Medicine Unequal Report, Unequal Treatment Report Committee that documents that given access, minorities still face huge disparities in the quality and intensity of care. And so we need to think of how we build incentives into the system to avoid that, that problem. But the major issue I want to talk about today is that if we will not short, fail to shortchange the next generation, we have to build health into healthcare reform. What I'm saying is that although health reform is critical, it will not be sufficient to improve our nation's health. We have to look beyond medical care to the social factors such as income and education and nutrition and housing that determine whether or not someone gets sick in the first place. Experts estimate that only 10 to 20 percent of preventable deaths are contributed by medical care. And we have to look at the factors outside of the healthcare system. Medical care is important, but medical care as practiced in the United States is a repair shop. It does a good job of taking care of us once we get sick. But if we want to live longer, healthier lives, if we want to increase the productivity of the United States workforce, if we want to improve our economic competitiveness, we need to focus on the factors that keep us from getting sick in the first place. The recommendations of our commission call for improvements in the places where Americans spend most of their time. 
in our homes, in our communities, in our schools, in our workplaces. What this all means is that we need to completely reframe what we mean by healthcare reform. If we succeed tomorrow and there's no American uninsured and healthcare costs are down, we would still not have addressed the major health problems facing this country. Research shows that for the first time in our history, we are facing the reality of raising a generation of children who will live shorter lives and sicker lives than their parents. And if we want to reverse this from happening, we need new policies that enable people to lead healthy lives where health actually happens, in the places where we live, where we work, where we learn, where we play, where we worship. So we really need this broader reframing and broader definition. One last point I want to make about health disparities. One of the things we discovered in the work of the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation Commission is that health disparities is not, are not just about the poor and not just about minorities. All Americans could be healthier. Our commission found that in almost every state, even the best of Americans, even the highest income and college educated are falling below national benchmarks in terms of health. So we need to address the huge shortfalls for minorities and the huge shortfall for low socioeconomic status groups. But we need to have programs and policies to improve the health of all Americans. Thank you, and as I have listened to my colleagues here and I look around this table, there is no doubt there's perhaps, perhaps hundreds of years of experience and commitment at, around this table with regards to looking at health disparities. And I think the unique aspect, as you mentioned at the beginning, is here we are in the cusp of perhaps the most significant piece of legislation around health care reform. And I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, I wanted to make a statement about equity. <coughs> the question of equity with regards to health care reform is how is equity going to be manifested in all the regulations and policies that are put forward? And whether equity can be demonstrated by equitable investments to improve quality and coverage, as well as prevention. So as mentioned earlier before, we talk about universal coverage, access. When it comes to equity, we're going to have to examine in the new health care reform legislation, whether that's in fact true. It doesn't make sense, for example, as speaking as a physician who cares for immigrant communities, why immigrant children have to live five years in the United States before they qualify for SGIN. Does not make any sense with regards to the kind of health care reform we're looking at. Doesn't make sense with regards to quality, with regards to looking at safety net institutions and holding them to a degree of incenting quality without making investments to improve quality in public hospitals and federally qualified health centers and other places like private practices in small communities where many of ethnic physicians actually operate in. How are we going to really make these investments so it's going to be equitable? I think finally the question with regards to prevention. When we look at prevention, <coughs> prevention is as American as mother and apple pie. But how is prevention really going to make a difference? to the communities that historically have always had unequal treatment and have had, had spirit social determinants. I think we have to look at bridging this medical model and the public health model and really come up with a new paradigm with regards to how we invest in communities of color to promote really healthy communities as the things that David was talking about. So the trial as well as the stakeholders around this table with regards to health care reform is how is equity going to be actually manifested in the regulations and policies that come down from just a mile away from here. That's the judgment that we're going to have to make and that's the investment we have to make. Thank you. One issue that I, I haven't heard a lot about today is um, the providing culturally and linguistically um, appropriate care and that's uh, one of the major barriers, especially in the Asian American community, um, and I think that we have to give a lot of thought to how we're going to provide those translation services for folks who um, won't understand the, the instructions or the care that they're receiving otherwise. Um, and we can work on that through the workforce development, um, getting folks who are from those communities trained. Um, but in addition, I think that we need to think about how to um, 
create a prevention sort of foundation that includes culturally and linguistically appropriate materials that target communities where we see a lot, a lot of health disparities. Yes, when you come this far down, you don't have a lot that's left to say. I want to applaud everybody for all you said, and I'm just going to briefly add one topic, and that is intimate partner violence. I hope it will enter the conversation. I won't say a lot about it, but it does impact the health of the person who, both the, the, the perpetrator as well as the uh, victim. Equity comes on many levels. It comes in terms of access and affordability. And for the LGBT community, one of the major issues is access. While they work for employers who offer health insurance, they're not able to um, afford that health insurance that's provided to them because they're, they have to pay additional taxes when they choose to cover their family members. And so on somebody who earns about $30,000 a year, the additional taxes that they have to pay is about $1,700. So it's contributing to um, the uninsured and something that we don't want to have and that health care reform is intended to fix. So hopefully as we go forward, equity will come across at many levels in access and affordability and in the tax code as we look at the benefits too. Great, thank you. As I've listened around the table, everything comes back to health equity, including health, in the dialogue as health reform instead of health care. Health care is one aspect. Also, building a public health infrastructure, very important in this conversation, along with funding for public-based and community-based or population-based health programs in the community. So as we talk about prevention, we also have to talk about funding. And then again, leadership and manpower cannot be emphasized enough, not just for physicians, but also for public health practitioners, those that are on the ground every day out in the field, conducting health education and other aspects of public health. And as we continue this dialogue, let's talk about those issues from the side of prevention along with building from the ground up. <coughs> and thank you for inviting me. There are, when well, I'm struck by is that um, when I have another life on this, Deputy Commissioner of Health, Baltimore City Health Department. And I remember when uh, we finally came close to eliminating tuberculosis and the mayor wanted to abandon the public health infrastructure. And so I'm worried that healthcare reform and access may be seen by some that you can abandon some of the things that already work. So I'm gonna speak quickly to some of the things that I believe that have worked, that have actually been abandoned in some ways by previous administration, and that I think that we need to make sure we focus on. One is the preserving the traditional safety net providers who have always been there. And there are a number of mechanisms that I think uh, that we can go after, uh, whether it is using a similar model that is, is used in FQHC so that uh, providers, instead of having to be forced to create a lookalike, you can actually create a, a separate category that wouldn't jeopardize FQHC funding uh, as sometimes often is perceived and you can create some of those benefits in the delivery system that allow providers that have been there to enhance their delivery services and prevention and wellness uh, and the others. To strengthen the, the, the minority serving in historically black medical schools, uh, their focus is generally has the same challenges that community-based, all community-based medical schools have, uh, that they are not able to cross-subsidize their education and research mission because they're not focused in high-margin delivery of services. I think there are series, several ways in which these can be sustained and strengthened, Title VII programs being one, uh, a number of others which I have recommendations that I will share with you, but I do think we have to preserve those. When it also comes to, um, and we also need to ensure we eliminate the caps uh, on, on, on residency program slots and primary care, and I know there are a number of those. Uh, the uh, balanced budget amendment has really curtailed a lot of activity there. We need to be sure that dish funding remains uh, with safety net hospitals. And these safety net hospitals will still have underinsured, if not, and a more vulnerable population. They'll need the resources, uh, additional resources that dish funding provides. In addition, I would, I would then focus on research because all of this is, is really about participatory research and people who are trusted in these communities. Uh, we know that from, our other, from other studies. I would only focus there 
that the elevation of the National Center for Minority Health and Health Disparities at NIH from a center to an institute would be critical. There's language that we've been put forth uh, that would do that. That would be critical to ensure that it acts more like some of the other institutes and has the resources the other institutes. There's also the ability to continue to fund and, and to restore funding uh, to the facility, research facility and major equipment programs of the National Center for Research Resources. Those fuel the capital that are needed in very high cost research, which would then, then be able to allow the traditional in, uh, people involved in health disparities research to have access to the technologies and tools that you need for, high, for, uh, for robust research and high quality research. So we have research issues, we have health, health security research issues that all of us are involved in. These programs work. We have uh, DISH funding, we have uh, FQHC model funding that can, can help with delivery systems. Uh, we have Title seven programs that need to be engaged. Uh, so I think there are several of those. I want to close my comment with only highlighting and reiterating the issues of the social and environmental determinants of health and their impact on the people that have been traditionally there, all of us in this room. They're often not recognized, the, the challenges we face in, in whether it's population-based research, which is really labor-intense research, and the communities that we've served. And so I, I think what we have is a great opportunity, not just to reform the payment system, but to reform health care. And we, often the changes have been around changing the payment system and improving and reducing costs. But I think we can really talk about health care and health reform uh, that will really touch base on all of us. And I think there are a series of, of programs that could be enhanced uh, and, and strengthened that need to be considered as well as new programs that need to be implemented. almost 40 years, more than 40 years, has been Medicaid. It gets much maligned 
Uh, in many states and in many communities, its payment rates are too low for the very providers located in underserved communities struggling to keep their practice doors open. Those need to be improved. But Medicaid is the most important and the only really, truly workable, affordable source of viable coverage for low income and minority populations. It needs to be sustained and expanded, especially because its benefits and what it offers and what it covers are so crucially important to the very needs that have been mentioned uh, here in terms of health care. Uh, secondly, with respect to workforce, Dr. Maupin eloquently spoke to the need to expand that. We do. We do not have a workforce that looks anything like America, much less like the, the America we see in this room today. We have got to do something about that. But I want to stress for the Secretary in particular the vital importance of the National Health Service Corps, a program that really meets two of the three crucial goals expands the primary care, it's targeted on primary care, and it will get people to those underserved communities that we talked about. <coughs> the only thing it doesn't do is assure a more diverse workforce, but there are models that work there. And finally, speaking of models that work, there are models that are working today and have been proven to be effective in reducing and even eliminating health disparities. Invest in those models that work. We need coverage. I said at the beginning, uh, uh, coverage does not equal access, and that's true, but access begins with coverage. We cannot have true open access to care and equity, as Winston talked about, in care unless people have coverage for that care, and then they need a place to go to get, as Adolf said, the right care at the right time for the right needs by the right people. being passed this year. It's important, it's essential, it's time. Uh, there are also in the Department of Health and Human <coughs> Services, as you all have identified, lots of building blocks of a health system that needs transformation. So part is you know, new legislation, implementation, but the underlying building blocks, Medicare, Medicaid, the whole information technology system, the Office of Minority Health, the Office of Women's Health, you know, what we're doing in terms of uh, the pipeline. Um, what I've asked, frankly, all of our new leaders to do is give me the lens of what we can do, how far can we transform the health system without any legislation ever being passed. Because we have a lot of tools, I think, within the agency that need to be um, used. So your input to not only roll up your sleeves, make sure we get the votes in the House and the Senate, to get a bill on the president's desk which he can sign, but also to help me as a new secretary who is very interested in the issues raised around this table, use the resources we already have 
to make a healthier America for all of us uh, would be really welcome. So get the information to Tina or directly to our office. We would welcome it and welcome your input and insight. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.